course, we've got uh, our speaker is Ron Gula from Gula Tech Adventures. Uh, I, su I suspect many folks in the room know Ron. Here he comes. And speaking with Ron is Elise Liberto, our moderator. Ron, Elise, welcome. Good to see you all. Go ahead and grab those mics. Thank you. Okay. Walking up, Ron asked if we could do this standing, which I think will be fun. I can see people in the back. When I was sitting there before, I was like, I couldn't see people talking. So no, this is how perfect. are you? I'm doing well. This is fair thing of the day. I'm really excited to be here moderating a fireside end of day chat with Ron Gula. I think most of the folks in the audience know Ron is the co-founder of Tenable, current president of Gula Tech Adventures, and really excited to dive in today. I think we could talk about so many things. I know we only have 30 minutes and we are in between cocktails. Alcohol. So we gotta keep it fun and punchy. Uh, but I thought two topics that would really make a lot of sense to cover would be one, Ron's experience building and scaling a company in and around the DMV area that really put cyber as a venture backable sector on the map. And then two, talk a lot about the opportunity at hand today for everyone who is attending DMV Rising to support for their innovation in and around cyber. So I know you give this story a lot, but maybe just quickly to level set for folks who may not know, talk to us a little bit about the founding story behind Tenable, why you, why in the DMV, how was it to start and scale from 2002 to 2018, a public company in our backyard? Absolutely, so I'll blame Marty for, for Tenable. Um, when we did Dragon, which was kind of in that network IDS early days, we had a quick exit. And uh, we sold that to Interesis Networks where I met Jack Hufford. And one day I was like, look, I'm kind of tired of detecting all the hackers. I want to do things to stop them. So Jack was more business, I was more tech. We started Tenable. He actually moved to, to, to DC. So I actually brought economy to DC before we even were successful, right? Um, but then, you know, we just started going down the road of building a company. And a lot of the things that people hit today, uh, like being in D.C. and thinking that they were a government organization, um, you know, we had to do all that. And, and I was stunned at some things along the way. So being in Maryland, you would think we would have sold to every county and the state and that kind of stuff. We, we hardly got meetings because we weren't successful yet. Once you're successful, you're a big name and, and, and that's fine. Another big thing that we had a problem with was recruiting talent going to a company, we were doing like 50 million revenue in like the, the, the mid 2000s. It was a risky thing for somebody to leave the NSA or Booz Allen and go to work at this startup. And that was stuff we had to really do. So one of the things we did is we, we fundraised and this was, a uh, we, we raised money from Excel Partners. You know, back in the day, they thought it was a big deal to go out from the West Coast to the East Coast. Today, people don't really have that barrier. If you've got good tech, you can get that from a lot of different places. But basically, as we grew Tenable, we really tried to just, you know, stay on top of, I mean, so, so many people talked about tech. I'm not going to go into the tech a whole lot, but we kept investing in the people, the culture, that sort of thing. I love the DMV area. I had a lot of people in Virginia, a lot of people in Maryland. If you've been to Merriweather, and I, I'm going there tonight, I have to leave really quickly. You can see the Tenable building. I've actually had people at Merriweather like, do you have anything to do with Tenable anymore? So I've been out about five years. And, and yeah, the people think it's, it's pretty funny. Awesome. Well, you mentioned risk taking there and kind of the journey of starting the company. Maybe reflect a little bit on all types of different types of risks that had to be taken to build Tenable to what it was today. Everything from thinking about automation versus services to going public versus potentially selling early and then using that as a, a catalyst point for lessons learned that you have that can inform some other entrepreneurs in the crowd. H how do you think about the risks you had to take and then how do you kind of nudge other entrepreneurs in the same direction today? So I, as, as part of Nagula Tech Adventures where we invest in companies, a lot of different cyber companies, I tell them, look, you have this sort of, ever, ever see uh, a foundation, right? Like Asimov, like he predicts you have these major crises, right? Well, crises are opportunity, right? So when we start Tenable, it's like, well, what's the balance between services and, and, and product? And we were very much, look, as much product as possible. And there's a lot of open source companies that that didn't do what Marty did. And, you know, they, they, they just made services, right? And they're, they're good businesses. There's nothing wrong with a service business. You just can't get the growth and scale and impact of what you want. So focusing on that was interesting. Now, another thing we did was we kind of crossed this bridge. Look, we had a lot of people who were competitors to us. And because of that, we ended up closed sourcing the, the Nessus vulnerability scanner. And I have had conversations like this with almost everyone in my portfolio companies where they've had some go to market. It's a freemium thing. It's an open source thing. It's a community thing. And then they realize like, oh, that community could be worth so much more. So they have to cross these, 
these kind of chasms as, as well. We had a couple offers along the way and they would have been great offers, things you write about. We walked away from a lot of, a lot of those. Some of them walked away from us. But, you know, I have, again, companies these days, you don't, if you don't know what you want, you're not going to, you're not going to get there. And then uh, finally, you know, raising the kind of money we did from Insight and Excel Partners, it kind of set us up for, for the IPO. I stepped away. That was a risk too. You know, I could have kind of stayed and, and kind of done things for a little bit longer. I wanted to move on and it was a good thing. Was risk taking already in your DNA or was, do you think a little bit of taking that West Coast capital and formed a new culture for the company or just what came first, kind of chicken or the egg? So a lot of what came first with, with Tim, I didn't realize we were doing this, but we were basically running a cash flow business from more or less day one. And I had the privilege of actually making a little bit of money on the previous transactions. I could float payroll every now and then. I think a lot of CEOs can relate. A lot of founders can, can do that. Um, by the way, if you're doing that, you're not counting it, you're doing yourself a disservice, defer your salary, track that kind of stuff. Um, if you have an exit, you'll get paid back in, 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 in spades. Um, but that was something we were, we were kind of doing. So we were excited to, and I say, we, I worked with my wife, right? So how many people here work with their spouse? Right. Right. That's a risk right there. Right. Life is complex enough. Um, you know, but that was what we wanted to do. And we're both engineers. So we, we kind of talk about being um, correct and not being right, right? It's it's better to get the engineering correct answer. But again, that's all a risk as as, as well. One other thread I want to touch on just on this kind of history of building the business that you did. You mentioned going to different counties and trying to sell. And, and one of the things that we talked about before today's presentation was some of the divisiveness, divisiveness that can sometimes be in the DMV area, whether that's NSA versus CIA, whether that's Maryland versus Virginia, whether that's West Coast Capital versus East Coast companies. Service okay. companies versus product companies, civilian yeah. versus military, it goes on and on. How did Ravens you, versus how did you, commanders, you know. How, how did you guys as a firm, how did you as an entrepreneur navigate some of those chasms? And then maybe to the more aspirational, what does it mean for everyone here? How do you then inform others to think about building bridges and being more united? So when we grew Tenable, a lot of what, I mean, I tried to go out and talk to the community, right? This was this was early 2000s. And I literally went some of the, and I'm not dissing economic development, because I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but it just wasn't as mature as it is now. But I literally went to a meeting, there was a room like this, and everybody who stood up was like opening up a Jiffy Lube, opening up a donut shop, opening up an exercise. And I'm stood up, I'm like, yeah, I'm selling cyber products to the DOD and the the there was no, there was no communication. Now it's a little bit different. It's, it's, it's very different. So I do tell all of our founders, they need to engage with the community, right? You're going to get leads from them. You're going to get employees from them. You're probably going to do business with them. But when it, but when we were running Tenable, we were real, once we got going, we were really international from day one. So I almost didn't want to focus on Maryland, but at the same time, I had a rep who was responsible for Maryland and they didn't really do a whole lot. And, but we did a lot with the community. Like a good example is a school would call up, hey, can we do a visit to your to, to the head? Sure, no problem. Can you come in and speak? Sure, no problem. I have employees go speak. Can I speak to somebody in your IT department and try to sell them vulnerability management? Oh God, well, no, 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 we can't do that, right? And I'm like, don't you realize like, if you have this interaction, like I tell every politician I meet, you gotta help people secure their stuff, right? You've got to encourage people to basically, you know, get into cyber and fund cyber and we're, whose idea was it to stand up here, right? But then the third thing is you have to buy local. And if you don't buy local, you lose this community, this communication of people, the developers working side by side with the customers and that sort of thing. And every county government I talk to and every state government I talk to, they miss out on that local opportunity. And uh, that's a great way to build like the DMV and rise. Yeah. And you think the best way to fix that is a cultural problem or more a, a policy incentives? Just you, you've thought about this a lot. How it, do it, we start to make... Well, it, it, it comes from the top, right? So if, if you know, if you're, politics is a dirty word, right? But if you want to get a community going, politics, the local government is one of the best ways to kind of get that going. And a lot of them have economic development groups. So one of the things that Cindy and I did after we left is she joined the Howard County Economic Development Authority. So she has like a front row seat and she was a board chair for a while. Like, how do you get companies to move? Or how do you get them funding? How do you get them, uh, you know, business loans and that sort of thing? And that's also a front row seat, by the way, to educate them on cybersecurity, which is something we need to do more of. Awesome. So maybe along the lines of what we need to do more of, and then shifting to the second topic of just generally speaking, how do we catalyze more innovation in around the DMV? 
one of the big questions we've been talking a lot about is why haven't there been more tenable scale outcomes in, in and around kind of our local region? And, and you could take that a number of different ways, maybe just quick reflections on why you think we don't have more and then we can maybe get to the more solutions or a conversation where how we get there. So I like to say, you know, when I left Tenable, I wanted to go create 10 Tenables, right? I'm behind schedule. Uh, we've got three um, billion dollar-ish companies in our portfolio right now. So I feel pretty good about that. Uh, only one of them in the DMV reason, right? And and so that it's it's tough. It's tough. I've actually had CEOs leave the region because they know they're going to be successful and they want to do some family tax, you know, financial planning, right? So what can we do to create the tenables, the source buyers, the the mandians, the big companies in the area? It's a number of things. So those three things I said, right? We got to educate everybody. We got to make it easy for people to found companies. And we've had a lot of venture capital here. I mean, Squadra's here, Data Tribe's here. Uh, I, there's a lot of people here that that want to help. And it's not just about writing a check, it's help them go. But then there's all sorts of of, uh, of nonprofits and organizations. We have like Mach 37 in Virginia. There's a lot of these things. Baltimore's got a whole bunch going on. But the problem is still, how do we get the young woman, the young man who's listening, working inside NSA, working inside the CIA, working inside the Pentagon, and realize that when they leave and they start a company, whether it's tech or cyber, that they're continuing the mission. And a lot of people don't realize this. And this is part goes into the why was cyber is kind of broken. We don't tell people that if you're in cybersecurity and you're defending a small business, you're actually on the front line of the cyber war. Nobody from DHS, nobody from the Pentagon, nobody from the NSACA prevents ransomware coming onto your computer. It's 100% vendors and the decisions that you make to, to, to put that stuff there. If you look at it like that, that can inspire a lot more people to take a risk and protect the country. And I tell people, there's a lot of ways to get your tech and solutions out there, right? You can you can open source it, you can give it away, you can, can, can try to kind of get it out, out there. But if you can build a company on it where you actually have people interacting with you, you will have more deployment than, than you would think and you'll be able to support it. And, and it's that sort of entrepreneurial vision tied with cybersecurity that I think if this region kind of got that, you would have 20 tenables, yeah. you know, that kind of, it doesn't rhyme as well as 10 tenables, but yeah. No, I love that. I love yeah. the reframing of the mission, really transcending, just building a yeah. business what it's for. Maybe just quickly, if you could reflect a little bit, I, I mean, as you mentioned, we talked a lot about technology today, but you do have a unique perspective. You're, you are investing now. You see a lot of the companies that come through actually in the DMV as well as on a, on a national level. Talk to us a little bit about where you are seeing opportunities in 2024. I, you don't have to call the entire cybersecurity landscape, but just maybe a few types of subsectors that you're finding interesting, you're seeing talent flock towards. Yeah, so there's two big things going on. So when we started, uh, you know, Tenable back in the late or early, early 2000s, you know, vulnerability management was a big category, right? Everybody understands you need to have your assets, you need to, you know, understand the risk and, and, and fix them. But if you looked at all the stuff Tenable added over the years, you know, we added mobile device coverage, right? We added cloud coverage, we added container coverage, right? We added all these different, different kind of things, Kubernetes now and APIs and all these kind of interesting things. Every one of those features could have been a company. And for big companies, when they run into to, to, to problems, they do want to acquire, you know, those things. So now, I, I mean, I've, we think we, at Google Tech, we've probably looked at about 20, 25 companies this, this last quarter or so. Um, a lot of them are niche. Like the ones that we don't even take a meeting with, it's because we've seen it the 15th, like no disrespect, right? AI is awesome. Socks are awesome. I don't want to invest in another AI sock, you know, company, right? But but there's good ones out there. Like that. So the question is like, what's really, really unique? Um, the, the last panel, they talked about quantum. There's a lot of hype about quantum. I get a lot of quantum resistant uh, cryptography package, you know, zero trust, that sort of thing. There's been a lot of people doing AI for security and security for AI. I don't know what that means. It sounds cool. Um, I talked to the, to me, it sounds like DevSecOps, which we've been doing and know how to fix, but we don't choose to do for, for, for a whole lot. I also like to look at this from a national security point of view, like what can we do to protect the country? And like some of our companies in our portfolio protect the DOD, some of them protect dentist shops. And, you know, I kind of want to make sure that those, those chips are, 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 are covered. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things like that that we're, we're looking for, but what I'm going to tell you is, the, the, the thing that catches our attention as an investor is basically a team that knows what they're doing. They have a problem they want to solve and they want to kind of get guidance from, from us. And so we, we, we got a couple of those we're going to be announcing in a, in a bit. Um, but yeah, tech is all over the place. It really is. Maybe a quick naive question from someone who's less entrenched than probably most of the folks in the audience, but just 
example, which I know was just great alliteration of selling the DOD and the dentist, maybe being two different companies, just in your experience in today's day and age of the current tech stack, do you think the companies will, that will win will be those that are selling both to traditional enterprise as well as the government? Or do you really think it's better to be bifurcated separately? Just what's your view there? Well, th this is, so the, the, we're, we're all here to try to, most of us are cyber people, right? I mean, it's DMV Rising, it's, it's a great name, but it's a lot of the cyber community, yeah. right? So, so I'm going to talk about cyber for a second. What have we done in the last 20 years, right? So now we have a, a, our second ONCD. We've got the National Cybersecurity Strategy. But we don't have honest conversations about cyber. Like, we don't tell people that they're really on their own. And we never really tell people that, by the way, if you F up, uh, it's okay. Like, CrowdStrike's still up, right? Um, Colonial Pipeline, it's okay, right? Um, I mean, DHS, we had somebody be able to hack a SQL injection, which is like, what, 20-year-old vulnerability? walk into that, right? So we have to understand with humility, cyber is not the number one thing that people care about, right? So when it comes to innovating things, why I'm such a fan of entrepreneurship is because if people are willing to spend money on it, they are going to use it. And we need to have these kind of things. So it's great to sell to the DOD. It's great if you can take that tech and sell it to the dentist office. But a lot of time, it's the same stuff. So talking about the tech stack and everything from quantum to AI, I think a really important piece of this equation is the talent piece. And you spoke about it as it relates to mission and inspiring people to join. Can you talk about what the DMV region needs to be doing to both cultivate and then retain talent that can really serve the next 10 tentacles? Yeah, so Mike Jakey and Bob Ackerman at Data Tribe, they always talk about how this region is the, the, the people who do cyber, are they're like the oil and we, we can mine that. And that's great. Fortunately, or opportunistically, right? A lot of those people kind of get pulled in to these great iconic companies like Northrop Grumman, Boeing, CSC, you know, that, that I don't think CSC is around, but you, you know, right? But the, the services companies. Again, there's nothing wrong with services, but I look at that as like uh, fracking, right? If you can inspire those people to leave and start companies and give them soft landings, you're going to be able to take those people who are working really tough problems. Like I've talked, there's a lot of cool things going on at the CIA, NSA, all these different kinds of places. People go out and start companies. We get pitches from a lot of these companies. I mean, Huntress is a good example. That's a former TAO enlisted operator who's defending dentist office, you know, which is which is which is a good thing. So the more we can give incentives for people to do those kind of transitions and go out to there, we need to have more of that. And there's a lot of different models, right? There's the traditional VC model. Uh, I've seen, a, I'm not going to go through the litany, but there's a lot of different economic incentives that we can give people to either land at incubators, land at technology accelerators, land at, uh, you know, do business with places like Afworks, Softworks, uh, D, you know, DIUX, that kind of, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of that going on right now. And I'm, I'm very much for it. So I know that you've committed a lot of your time to mentorship after operating and building the company. Do you feel that mentorship is where it should be at the DMV of, of other operators and maybe just reflect a little bit on that culture? Yeah. So as a, I mean, as a, as a venture capitalist, when we invest in a company, we want to join the board. We want to have the ear of the founder. And so I kind of feel like I do mentorship all, all day. But what I tell people is that you need to mentor other people as well. So you got to do the diversity that you got to reach across the aisle. You got to do, you know, I tell Republicans to work with Democrats. I tell, you know, all, all the kind of things to, to kind of, unless you're purposeful, you're not going to go do that, but it'll make you a better founder. If you're found, if you're advising somebody else, who's at a different stage in, uh, in, in, in development, and you don't have to do it in this kind of form. You could do it one-on-one. -on -one. You could do it informally. Some people want to have a official advisor role with, you know, stock options and stuff like it. I don't care. It's, it's like, you should do that. I also think people who are doing a company, if you're going to go out and raise money from a venture capital firm, you should be doing seed investing, right? Eat your own dog food, right? If you're going to go ask money for somebody, you should be so good that what you're doing, that you're investing in other people and helping that, that, that other founder out. Not to be controversial, what, but what do you think today for a high quality entrepreneur building an at scale potential business? What do you think is the biggest, I don't want to say deterrent, but um, the biggest potential pull that is pulling them out of the DMV and, and then I'm really getting to how we solve for that. But So the, sure a deterrent know. that's pulling them out of the DMV? Yeah, there are venture capitalists that are telling them to move to the Bay Area. Uh, what do you think is potentially incentivizing some people to do that? And then how do we make sure it doesn't happen to the future entrepreneurs? So I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with this a lot because one of the things I tell founders to do is to do financial planning, right? You need to know at a moment's notice, if somebody walks up to your company and offers you $30 million of stock, right? $30 million in cash. What does that mean for you, your family, your, your church, your relatives, your trust, that kind of stuff? What does it mean for your employees? 
if you're not, if you can't do it for yourself, you can't lead your employees. And if you can't know what that deal is, you're, you're not going to be able to do that. So unfortunately, when somebody looks at the tax burden of having an exit or raising capital or selling secondary stock, and they literally go, oh, my aunt lives in Florida and she pays zero taxes. You know, we get a lot of people who go to Florida. Now, sometimes that's just the CEO who, who, who commutes. Sometimes the whole company moves and it's tough. So one of the things that we have sort of in our arsenal to keep people in this region is tax incentives. Uh, one of the things I've invested in a bunch of companies that are in something called an opportunity zone. Now, these are kind of a real estate focused type of an event, but it's basically you're required to have your employees in these zones. You don't pay any federal taxes in them, but you maximize state taxes. That sounds like a good thing to a state governor to kind of hear. And, and, and that's the kind of stuff I've been I've been pushing with people. But you know what? Most of the time when I see people leave or move or something, nobody wants to move during a startup, right? Usually it's something dramatic that's happened. They've gone through uh, a family crisis, a big family change. There's a huge, like maybe somebody says, well, if you move down here, we're going to give you free rent at this facility for like five years. Sure, states will do that. I had people come to Tenable and get me to move here in Virginia, and you'd be surprised some of the stuff they threw out. But, um, but yeah, it happens. It happens. Well, in addition to great tax incentives, I know that having local investors is a really big incentive for companies to stay in and around the region. Can you reflect a little bit for maybe folks who are less familiar with what you and your wife have created at Gula Tech Adventures, what you're doing today and, and what you have done the organization? Yeah, so it's Gula Tech Adventures. Um, it's an adventure. We're not a travel organization, right? You know, it's, it's, but it's what you, the journey everybody here is on is an adventure, right? So we primarily focus on investing in cyber and tech startups. We're stage agnostic. We've put over a hundred million dollars to work on a bunch of exits. It's all at gula.tech, but we're also very focused on community and raising public awareness. So we've had the Gula Tech Foundation where we basically focus with nonprofits. We basically force them to do pitches to us that are commercial pitches because they're businesses. Their businesses. Somebody comes out, they say, I want to, hey, I'm going to take $3 million and do, um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, training in the inner city for cyber, right? We're going to use X, Y, Z. Great. Show me your plan, right? Show me your plan. Try to get focused on outcomes, right? So we've done about eight of those grants and uh, we've been pretty involved with a lot of those, th those funds. But then the last thing we do is just public awareness. So everything from going down here to DC, state capitals, talking to, to folks doing public awareness like this, the YouTube channel that we put together has got a lot of people. We do a lot of this kind of conversation. It's got some funny YouTube 3D videos that I do and stuff like that. It's, it's, uh, it, it strikes a nerve with a lot of people. Awesome. Well, yeah. I'm looking at the clock, so maybe um, three quick final questions sure. from me on public order to some can open up the crowd. First would be, what is your favorite YouTube video they produced? He's been super humble, over 200,000 subscribers. It's become really a bastion of education in the sector. What are you most proud of to put out there? So the 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 one two ago I really like. So um, the hard part about communicating about being on a board and stuff like that is I can't be like like, like Brian's in the back. I can't, I can't be like, oh, I just came out of this threader board meeting. Brian's the CEO over there. Oh, and just go on social media and say what I liked or didn't like, right? So what I can do is I can make a video that's generic and everybody can learn from. So we had a bunch of exits this this past year. Congrats. And it, thank you. And it and it's uh um it struck me that everyone was a little bit different. Every founder's journey was a little bit different. So remember the Matrix 2? Remember when Neo is there with um Seraph and he has they got the key master going down that hallway. So I have a female Neo who's the founder and she's like, hey, I need an exit. And he's like, there's an IPO at the end of the hallway and there's a bunch of agents in the hallway. And every agent is like, I'll hire your company, but you got to move to San Francisco or, you know, I'm just doing market research. I'm going to meet with you 100 times and never buy your company. Right. So there's but she's fighting Neo style the whole way down. So I got like 100,000 views and people are lamenting. Um, there was one other one. I had a roadmap meeting, not Threader. But the, the roadmap meeting was not very good. And so I made a video on how to do roadmaps. And the, the vignette in front of it was kind of Mad Max, the roadmap warrior. And the truck's going down the road. And like, we got to stick to the plan. First guy comes by. I will pay you to add a feature that only my company needs. Right. That kind of stuff. Right. So there, it's a lot of fun. Well, very everyone, therapeutic. Everyone will check out the, uh, the channel. <laughs> Maybe second would be a nonprofit that you all have supported that everyone in this room should know about and or potentially for some who are thinking about ways that they can get back and be mentors to others. Yeah, first of all, I'll say no checks too small to get involved with a nonprofit. But if you're here, you're probably smart enough to run a company. You're probably smart enough to advise a nonprofit. So you can either you can do one of two things. Pick one, focus on that, blinders on everything else, or try to spread around. 
um, you know, the, the last check that we just wrote um, uh, was for Voting Works. And uh, that's Ben Idita. It's basically a nonprofit that uses open source hardware and software to um, have uh, safe and secure and, and modern elections, right? Even though elections is a critical infrastructure, most people's election gear is like 25, 30 years old and is expensive and hard to use. So that's that's one, for example. We, we list a lot of the grant winners on the website too, so yeah. No, it's a ton of one. And then third and final, I know it's the e most evil question to ask someone to pick their favorite child. So I'm not asking you to pick your favorite portfolio company, but maybe of the companies you invest in or even just anyone you've heard the pitch of recently that's in the DMV area, you heard the pitch and you said, gosh, this gets me excited about innovation that's happening in my backyard. What's got you excited? I, I got to pick a problem child, right? Or, or, a, or a, 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 it could, yeah, it could be a, you know, the, the most controversial companies often have the biggest outcomes, which is something that gets you inspired about the innovation that's happening locally. Well, this is, this is real interesting because I'd like to thank Virtue for advertising this, this event and inviting me to speak. And of all the portfolio companies we had in the area, only Brian from Threader came. So Threader is a company that does inline um, uh, threat filtering, uh, verse virtually and with, with hardware. And, and they are my favorite, uh, company in this room. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So I think we're right on time. We made up for schedule, but if anyone has any questions, wants to pop in, this is fun, lively, we're on our feet. Anyone just want to scream out questions or just continue them over cocktails later to you guys. Perfect. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Really fun. Thanks All right. guys. All right. Thank you.